Okay, uh, I uh, guess we'll get started. I thought uh, we might have someone from Life Enrichment come in and dim the lights, but I don't know if that's necessary. I think these transparencies are pretty, pretty easy to see uh, <coughs> with, uh, without the lights being dimmed. So, so uh, today uh, we're going to uh, go into uh, uh, a relatively complicated thing uh, about how a cell is able to read off the DNA, off its DNA, and through a uh, a series of uh, activities. Uh, translate that reading into the production of the proteins uh, that uh, the cell needs to sustain itself. And these proteins are extremely complicated molecules. Uh, uh, in, in, in fact, uh, uh, they're sufficiently complicated that... Uh, there we go, we're getting some help with the lights now. <laughs> Thanks. Oh. Right there, that's what Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so I, uh, as I said, this is going to be one of the more complicated things. Uh, so for those of you who are not scientists, uh, just sit back, uh, recognize the co com incredible complexity and, and yet accuracy uh, that goes on in each cell in your body uh, and uh, uh, stand in admiration of the biologists who managed to figure it out uh, and uh, have brought us to the stage of the understanding that we have uh, of this process. So I'm going to start out uh, with this. Uh, I uh, was somehow moved for this I'm rereading it. I don't know how I was moved quite as much as I felt uh, at the time. But at any rate, this was an, an account of a talk given by Francis Crick uh, seven, nearly 70 years ago. And uh, uh, here it is. Uh, one of the most significant lectures in the history of biology was given on the 19th of September, uh, 1957, by Francis Crick. As part of a, a, as a part of Society for Experimental Biology Symposium on the Biological Replication of Macromolecules, held at the University College London, originally entitled "Protein Synthesis," the title acquired a more magisterial introductory "on" in the publication, uh, which occurred the following year. The lecture went further uh, than its title suggested. As Crick pointed out in the opening paragraph, he also addressed other central problems of molecular biology, those of gene action and nucleic acids, acid synthesis. This is a quote from, the, from Crick's talk. I shall argue that the main function of the genetic material is to control not necessarily directly, the synthesis of proteins. There is little direct evidence to support this, but to my mind, the psychological drive behind this hypothesis is uh, at the moment independent of such evidence. So in a sense, uh, Crick is uh, acting uh, much more like a physicist which is what he was uh, initially started out to be. That is, he's much happier to speculate uh, on uh, information uh, and uh, try to come up with some general picture uh, of what uh, would be helpful in understanding uh, the problem that was being attacked. So Crick took these ideas and the experimental data that's increasingly suggested that RNA was some kind of an intermediate between DNA and protein. Uh, actually, uh, apparently, the data referred to ribosome 
at the time, rather than to messenger RNA, and developed a scheme to explain the relation between these three classes uh, of biological molecules. In so doing, he had to get to grips with exactly what was in a gene and what took place if DNA was used as the template for RNA, not in biological terms, but in the most abstract way possible. As Crick later acknowledged, a more accurate description than the central dogma would have uh, been a basic assumption. It doesn't sound quite so sexy, but would have had removed a lot of subsequent misunderstanding. Perhaps Crick, uh, ha if Crick had not used such a dramatic phrase, uh, many subsequent critics would not have become so exercised uh, oh, uh, oh, uh, about the question. Uh, Crick was later quite harsh on his own lecture, describing it as a mixture of good and bad ideas, of incense, of insight and nonsense. And they're, they're down in the bottom, it's probably kind of hard to read, uh, but it just simply uh, points out that the, uh, at the heart of the central dogma is the information flow is in one direction, from the DNA to RNA, and by the time it gets into protein, it's irretrievable. Uh, it doesn't go back uh, at, at all to be encoded that way. So, to get down to the, the business at hand, uh, we had just last week gone over the process by which a cell replicates itself. Involved in that process, process are many components that have to be produced in the daughter cells if they're to be capable of reproduction. Uh, those products incur, uh, include uh, DNA polymerase, DNA primase, two DNA helicases, DNA uh, binding proteins uh, that help it to open up the DNA helix so that it can be copied, uh, a DNA ligase and and enzymes that degrade the uh, RNA primer uh, to seal it together. Uh, there's just no need to go into that list other than to point out that the cell has to be able to create a whole bunch of very complicated uh, molecules if it's going to be able uh, to uh, uh, continue to function and reproduce. How does it do that was the uh, uh, the big question at the time. Uh, now, central to the stuff that has to get produced are proteins. Uh, uh, but getting into uh, uh, how, how the cell produces uh, these proteins, let's first take a look at, at proteins as molecules and see how different they are from non-biological mole molecules. Uh, they're so different that chemistry actually is broken into two uh, different branches, one called organic chemistry that deals with uh, mole the molecules built around carbon and, and, uh, and the rest. Uh, to me, that was a rather funny uh, separation as I always thought carbon dioxide and water were sufficiently similar that you didn't need to break chemistry into two halves. Uh, in order to uh, dope that out. However, the molecules assembled by living organisms are different from inorganic molecules. Uh, the inorganic molecules, since it's like metals and, and crystals, are typically stable and hard. Just think how different a piece of rock is from a piece of meat, uh, which is an assembly of biological cells. Uh, and the bonds that are in that uh, in that meat, many of them uh, actually are hydrogen bonds. Uh, and uh, and as, as you recall, this is the bond that makes water out of out of H, a group of H two O molecules. As long as the temperature is above thirty two Fahrenheit and below uh, two hundred and twelve. Uh, <coughs> So that's how they, how you get water. So what is a protein? Well, uh, 
They are macromolecule polypeptides. Sure. Doesn't help a great deal. Uh, more usefully, they're very large molecules capable of carrying out an array of functions in the cells of living creatures. Proteins are made from linear chains of 20 amino acids and that are found in all living creatures. Once formed, the linear chains spontaneously themselves fold on into specific shapes that are actually quite crucial to their executing their function in the cell. Proteins vary in size from sequences of just 100 amino acids to sequences up, of, up to 30,000 amino acids. They're rather difficult to produce in the lab, and so industry often uh, has recourse to using bacteria to produce the, the proteins that, uh, that, they, uh, that they, want to, uh, they want to use. So protein comes from, uh, comes from the Greek, uh, proteus, meaning first place, uh, and suggests the, first, the primary role that the, these molecules might play in life. All biological proteins are assembled from just 20 amino acids. Of course, from 20 amino acids in any arbitrary number and arrangement uh, could give you a nearly infinite number uh, uh, of, of uh, different kinds of proteins. In ourselves, uh, we have about 20,000 different proteins, and E. coli, uh, that simple uh, bacteria that we've been using, uh, uh, has uh, about 4,300. The mass uh, of a protein is uh, expressed in kilodaltons, uh, which is a thousand atomic mass units. An atomic mass unit is one twelfth the mass of a carbon atom. So the mass of a protein in kilodaltons is one thousand of the of the total number of neutrons and protons in that protein. Uh, divide that by ten and to get the approximate number of atoms in the protein. Divide that by twenty, and you get a good estimate as to the number of uh, amino acids. Uh, the lightest protein has a mass of about four kilodaltons, and so is only a chain of about 20 amino acids, while the largest is titan. Titan? Good enough? Uh, uh, 3,000 kilodaltons made with over 10,000 amino acids. All or, uh, organic proteins are built as peptide chains, which are linear arrays of amino acids bonded by uh, bonded by uh, the polytech, poly uh, peptide bond, uh, which is a where the sequence of the particular amino acids uh, is specified in the cell's DNA. The folding of the peptide chain in the final protein configuration is an essential element uh, in the protein's role in the cell. Uh, and that folding is critically dependent on the sequence uh, of the amino acids. So uh, here's what an amino acid is. Here is uh, the amino group. Uh, this is this carbon in the center is referred to as the alpha carbon. So it's the, uh, the thing that actually ends up bonding and this side chain here tells you what particular amino acid it is. And this carboxyl group over here is just part of the chain. So what happens it, to make the, the, the bond is uh, this, uh, this end of the carboxyl group comes in contact with the amino group. This OH here separates from one of those hydrogens generating water and the chemical bond uh, is then formed. And if you repeat that over and over and over, you get a chain uh, of these uh, uh, amino acids and, and it's referred to as a polypeptide chain. 
that polypeptide chain due to the interaction between the elements in the chain folds itself over. Uh, as shown here, it seems to uh, initially get into some helical form and then further twists uh, into a, 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 a fixed structure uh, that is absolutely uh, critical as many of the things that go on in the cell depend on how well these various big macromolecules fit together. And just some more pictures here is the amino acid glycine. Uh, so uh, this is uh, uh, a uh, uh, oxygen over at this end. Here are two carbons here. This is the alpha carbon. And in glycine, there's just two hydrogens bonded to it. Uh, in uh, uh, the, uh, another uh, uh, <coughs> amino acid alanine, uh, the uh, side chain uh, is uh, carbon uh, with three hydrogens bonded to it. So uh, they then fit together to make glycoalanine. I guess that'll work. <laughs> and and here, here again, it's just showing some more uh, of those sequences, the way they come together, and you end up with this linear chain where the interaction between the elements along the chain determine how it folds up. So the cell has to be able to create these linear chains and do it uh, unfailingly and, uh, and accurately. Questions? Fantastic. Okay. It's either a masterpiece of clarity or obscurity, I can't tell which. <laughs> the task of, of figuring out how the, how the cell's DNA prescribes for the, ascension, for the construction of these proteins was, is, is formidable. Uh, it was known somehow that the, the cell had to prescribe the correct sequence of amino acids to assemble a specific protein. It was also believed that the prescription for the proteins was contained in the cell's DNA. From what was known of the structure of DNA in the late 50s, it was clear that directly uh, accessing the information contained in that tight string, uh, remember things, these things are really knotted together pretty, pretty tightly, would be difficult. So there's another nucle nucleic acid called ribonucleic acid uh, a, a, that is a, a tight string that, that uh, is single-stranded and hence, because of its single strand, uh, the uh, nucleotides involved in it become uh, uh, far more uh, amenable uh, to uh, know what they are and, of course, you might worry that they become far more amenable to uh, deleterious chemical activity, but uh, uh, apparently evolution has worked it out so that uh, most of the time it works well enough. Recall now that there are just 20 amino acids involved in assembling all biological proteins, and somehow the four nucleotides must prescribe the correct sequence of those 20 amino acids. Someone readily figured out uh, that, uh, that a sequence of at least three nucleotides had to be uh, involved in identifying an amino acid. Uh, and that's simply because one uh, uh, nucleotide could only specify for four, uh, uh, for four amino acids, two, could specify for four times four, so or 16, still not enough, but if you have three, you can specify for 64. So that certainly uh, 
covers you for the 20 and gives you uh, a lot of opportunity for redundancy, uh, which the cell does make uh, use of. Uh, it's terrific. Now, but how, how, could the, how could scientists ever figure out how a cell actually communicated uh, the necessary information to construct those proteins. And it, 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 to my mind, it took some lucky and ingenious Nobel Prize winning experiments by many biologists to solve this problem. Uh, I won't go into those experiments, mostly because I couldn't, uh, but, but rather describe the results that emerged and keep emerging. In, in 1959, Nirenberg and Mathai uh, found that sequences of uracil in artificially made uh, DNA, RNA uh, caused E. coli. So again, E. coli is a very central figure in, in, in working out a lot of the, the, these things. Uh, to add the amino acid phenylalanine to a protein. Subsequently, they then found out the, se the sequence of cytosines. C caused the addition of the amino acid polypropylene uh, to a peptide chain. So there you were, three, three U's uh, gave you a phenylalanine and, and three C's uh, gave you uh, a uh, a, uh, 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 polypropylene. So, and I should actually say what these C's are. U is uracil, which if you recall in, uh, in uh, RNA uh, is replacing thiamine, uh, which is, is how uh, uracil appears in DNA. When thiamine appears would it would it have appeared in RNA? It actually is shows up as uracil. C is cytosine, uh, and uh, and uh, <coughs> is one of the uh, things that uh, mates with. Oh, help me! Uh, senior moment. Cytosine bonds with. Guananine. Guananine, thank you. <laughs> that, that's Charles Laird in the back there. He's a very knowledgeable chap. Uh, the race, so there, so there you go. So they now know it's three, three of a kind, three, uh, a sequence of three is needed, and you've got now two, uh, two possibilities. So the race is on now that you have to go and figure out what all the other uh, what, what all the other combinations of three uh, actually mean. And within five years, uh, they ended up getting it, getting it all straight. Uh, and, and of course, there was the question, well, here we are fooling around with E. coli. Uh, is, that, is this what E. coli use, uses, or does uh, any, any, anyone else uh, end up using this sequence? Uh, and uh, fortunately, everything does it pretty much the same way. So here we are now onward to setting up the translation between DNA sequences. So now we have to go between connecting three sequences on your DNA that have been read onto RNA, uh, and how do you now convert that into an amino acid? Uh, and you do that by virtue of these codons. So, <clears throat> as a result of that five years of research, the, the, then the following identification has been made for the 64 possible sequences of three successive nucleotides. So here's, the, you seem to find it in the literature in two ways. Here's the first letter, U, uh, this is the second letter, and this is the third letter. So, uh, so here's three U's showing up, and uh, sure enough, it prescribes for phenylalanine. Uh, and uh, 
Let's see if I can find the three C's. C's. Three C's. There we are. <laughs> and, and that was for Pro Proline. Proline. Uh, these names uh, are are just absolutely uh, 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 difficult. I'm sure if you live with them, uh, uh, you, you get to remember them. I uh, certainly ended up knowing the this in detail the spectrum of sort of the first 20 energy levels of the first 40 nuclei uh, when I was working <laughs> in nuclear physics but you have to live with it to uh, uh, memorize it or have some particular guess so <clears throat> so uh, uh, so the cordon th these cordon charts tell you the way the sequences are as they are read on the M on MR uh, on uh, messenger RNA so that's why thiamine uh, it, why you always see U and no T so uh, uracil is there in place of thiamine and there's obvious redundancies because there's 64 possibilities for only 20 acids uh, but each codon only specifies for a particular amino acid. The translation codon on amino acid appears to be uni nearly universal and is taken as further proof of a common ancestry uh, for all life uh, for all life on Earth. I think it's a a, 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 a very remarkable uh, thing uh, that ended up uh, being uncovered as a result of this. If one had uh, any doubts about evolution and how it might have come about, uh, it, it seems to me the commonality of the, the how your DNA uh, is read and the fact that it's so universal uh, that it, it uh, is uh, actually used uh, by fact the same codes are used by virus. So, okay, so we figured out how to do it, but how in the name of God does this bacterial cell do it? How about some questions? Well, uh, we get amino acids in some of our... Yeah, thank you. We get amino acids in some of our diet. Yes. And, uh, so corn for a while didn't have one, and somebody tweaked the gene so it would now have better amino acids. But I assume the cells kind of grab some of this rather than synthesize it. Absolutely. Uh, as far as I can tell, uh, for the most part, cells take and ingest food, break it down to the amino acid level, and proceed pretty much from there. I noticed you snuck in, snuck in polypropylene at one point, <laughs> which is a common plastic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, how does a cell do it? Well, first of all, it has to get the correct information off the DNA in the form of the correct sequences of three nucleotides. The cell has to convert that information into corresponding amino acids. The amino acids have to be linked together in the correct sequence to make the, uh, to make the de desired polypeptide chain, and that ch chain then, uh, just as a result of natural forces, uh, will subsequently fold into the appropriate shape to carry out its role in the cell. So, as outlined, uh, the cell faces quite a task to create those complex molecules. It needs to form, uh, uh, in the case of an E. coli, uh, here it's got this, its DNA, uh, which as you remember is, has something like 4.6 million base pairs uh, on it. Uh, there, uh, there are uh, uh, 4,288 genes on it, so it's uh, got to go and 
grab a hold of one of those genes because each one of those genes uh, 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 prescribes for a particular macromolecule. So <clears throat> the collection of, 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 of proteins uh, called uh, an RNA uh, preliminaries attaches to a promoter sequence in, in the DNA located uh, some 35 to 10 base pairs upstream of a gene that's to be transcribed. So some here, here's an RNA polymerase. It's moved into uh, an exact location somewhere along this genome. Uh, there's a kind of a stopper in, in front of it that uh, doesn't let it proceed unless uh, it, it's useful and desirable that it go ahead and do that. So. Uh, when uh, it, that, that signal uh, is received, the stop is removed, and this polymerase begins, uh, first of all, opening up the DNA, uh, moving in, and as it moves along the, D the DNA, it reads off the DNA a sequence that it puts onto a chain of RNA. Uh, and we'll sh I'll show you how you how you do that in detail uh, in, 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 in case you're in, in interested. Uh, so that RNA strand is the copy of what's on the cell's DNA uh, because of the unique bonding you recall. Guanine always bi binds with cytosine and uh, uh, adenine with thymine, which. It, and the thymine shows up as you know, uracil uh, when it's in the form of RNA. Uh, so the formation of that strand continues until it gets to the end of the gene, copying for that thing, and in which case the MRA, uh, messenger RNA, separates the uh, right the polymerase uh, and uh, ends up uh, being discharged and presumably breaks up uh, to be used uh, subsequently. That piece of uh, uh, messenger RNA moves into the cells. Uh, we lost your sound. Wow. You disconnected yourself. Ah. Back. Yep. Not back. Okay. Uh, uh, there is a, a, in the cell. The, you'll, I'll show you some pictures of it. So a large molecule uh, called a ribosome. Uh, or, no, this is the polymerase. Excuse me. Uh, it's outcut. The RNA. The piece of RNA uh, is copied off the DNA, shipped uh, off with a leading sense. Uh, of the five point five prime five prime end, uh, and and of course what's been happening is that the uh, uh, this RNA polymerase has been grabbing the pieces that it needs uh, of the uh, uh, nucleotides to for, to put together the, the uh, proper complementary chain. So the next step uh, now involves using some molecules we haven't talked about yet. Jerry, yeah. May I interrupt? Uh, Please. Point out that only one strand of the DNA is being transcribed. You bet. Yeah. I was going to get to that. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. That's okay. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> How does this all do it? To do. See if I if I end up uh, doing it right. The next uh, cell uh, steps involve using some molecules we haven't yet discussed. They're out in the cell's cytoplasm. One set is called ribosomes, and they're formed by two pieces, a large and small. Brilliant. Uh, there's something you can understand. That's the small one. That's the large one. 
and and uh, uh, with that, uh, uh, and this thing has in it some uh, some RNA uh, that's called R right R for ribosomal uh, RNA that's in here and helps it. Uh, to uh, do the job that it has to do in being able both to read what's uh, on the uh, on, on the messenger RNA and uh, to match it to a, a corresponding piece called a, tran a tRNA for for transfer RNA. The transfer RNA uh, carries uh, with it an amino acid on one side of the molecule. <laughs> So here's a, a, a particular amino acid, and on this other side of that same uh, piece of RNA uh, molecule uh, is the anticodon associated with that amino acid. So that anticodon will be matched with the codons on the messenger RNA for the particular piece of amino acid. That, to me, is just absolutely incredible that that occurred, and uh, evolutionarily, uh, uh, apparently, that's the way that we went about doing it. These tRNAs, which I'll say a little bit more about later, are, are constructed using, uh, obviously, genes that are present in, in, in the DNA. Now, it, it, recall the start code uh, on, on the RNA. Uh, you wouldn't recall it because I didn't point it out. So here's the start code. <laughs> this is the start uh, code. It also uh, is, is the uh, methylene... Methionine. Methionine? Yeah. Methionine uh, is this is is uh, the uh, um, the uh, amino acid that is is used as the start, and the stops uh, are uh, uh, typically tryptophan uh, and uh, a U UAG and a UAA stop which apparently doesn't prescribe for any particular uh, amino acid. So, Excuse me, there's a question here. Ah, sure. So, uh, tryptophan is used for helping people sleep. It's a uh, protein that is found especially in Turkey and uh, certain uh, nuts and so forth, and uh, they are good to eat toward the end of the day to help us sleep, so it's just interesting. Yeah, that's why we allegedly feel so sleepy after Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> Got it. Okay, so it's just interesting that it shows Yeah, you bet. Thank you. <laughs> That, by the way, is one of the hard problems, I think, in, in, in doing biology, is staying with the subject <laughs> and not wandering into Thanksgiving dinner. I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's quite all right. <laughs> oh, let's see here. Da -da 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 -da. So... So, okay, so uh, I, I guess that uh, the, uh, uh, this uh, piece of uh, mRNA entered into the ribosome. The ribosome accepts it as the first thing and makes that uh, uh, an initial uh, amino acid. And then subsequently takes from the cytoplasm uh, the appropriate uh, uh, tRNAs to match the next three uh, uh, nucleotides on the messenger RNA chain. So, and it keeps on doing that sequentially 
till you end up building a whole chain uh, of these uh, amino acids, which uh, is the polypeptide uh, chain that we uh, talked about. And it uh, will uh, uh, eventually end up folding itself uh, into uh, the useful protein shape that the cell uh, that the cell requires. So it is just a, 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 an amazing sequence of events where the cell obviously has to know where to start and where to end in order to read the, the genome from uh, the uh, uh, beginning to its proper end and the sequence uh, has to be uh, correct. When, it, when they're done, the mRNA uh, a, a, a breaks up, the ribosome comes apart, and the pieces are to be used again. I thought it was useful to go back to this picture so that you can see uh, just what these things look like in a cell. These big critters here uh, in dark purple are the ribosomes. And there's a lot of them. Uh, because you're, they're continually at work. There's 20,000 of ribosomes uh, in an E. coli cell. And as you might imagine, that, that thing has to keep fishing out these uh, little tRNAs to uh, uh, put together uh, the, uh, the uh, polypeptide chain. So you need many more of these, and in fact, there's roughly about 200,000 uh, of these in, a, in, in, in an E. coli cell. And there you have, you have to work hard because they're small. Here's one, here's one, here's another. They're all over the place. So uh, this uh, wonderful painting by uh, uh, Goodsell uh, uh, is, is so helpful, or at least it was to me, in getting a sense of just what these things might, I, I, I hesitate to use the word look like in a cell, but they help you uh, to develop some kind of a picture in it. Here you see the uh, ribosomes uh, are uh, digesting a piece of mRNA, uh, messenger RNA, and uh, presumably, uh, I'm not sure, this is a messenger RNA, uh, I can't find a piece of a, pro, a protein, a, poly, a, pro, a polypeptide chain coming, uh, coming out of the ribosome, but that's probably my failing. So here. Jerry? Is, yeah? Is this in the lower right hand corner, is that an example of folding, or is that just... Excuse me. Wait, wait, wait for that. <laughs> in the lower right hand corner. It's, it's still, is you hearing it? No. Um, Close to your mouth? Okay. Yeah. Okay. There you go. All right. So in the lower right hand corner, the picture, whatever it is, um, is that an example of folding of these strings, or is that just something else? <coughs> oh, so th this is uh, so uh, there's a ribosome. I take this to be a uh, a, uh, a messenger RNA. Uh, and I, I'm not sure I know what to look for to What's find the polypeptide chain. The spaghetti, the you know, spaghetti. the yellow spaghetti what? stuff is? Up this stuff? The yellow. The spaghetti. The spaghetti. This? Yeah. This, this stuff? <laughs> this stuff? That, that, that's DNA. Okay, so that's the DNA. And here's, uh, you know, some uh, ribosome. Uh, or uh, 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 RNA uh, polypeptide uh, creating some messenger RNA uh, uh, off. I, I, assume, thing. I assume when looking at that that the orange might be the mRNA or orange clumps on the on the DNA. 
<laughs> this is the DNA, and, and, and here's some polymerase uh, writing on it, opening it up. So that may be who the message RNA is. Uh huh. The orange. Well, I took this stuff here to be messenger RNA because it was certainly entering into the ribosome. But, uh, maybe. Yeah, but at any rate, you, you, it just gives you a feeling of really how complicated uh, it is <laughs> and how much is going on in really close proximity and how the whole darn thing works to uh, make you and I uh, or even E. coli uh, it's just amazing because this is not you and I this is a piece of E. coli uh, as painted by uh, uh, Dr. Goodson okay whoops okay and here, here here's a picture of just what that one of those uh, a model of that tRNA molecule is down here are the three codons that uh, uh, are you attach to uh, that are attached in the ribosome, matching up to the messenger RNA. And here at its end is the uh, amino acid to be released. And they are presumably these little guys. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, for just good sport, and I know it's the kind of thing you enjoy doing, uh, <laughs> I, I was going to uh, just take you on that ride from uh, how you go via the nucleotides, uh, from uh, DNA to mRNA to tRNA to amino acid. So, on a piece of DNA, you uh, go ahead and uh, Here's that piece of DNA. And then, as was pointed out by my very wise colleague, uh, uh, Lester, uh, it only needs to read because the mRNA piece is, has to lead with a five, with five prime, so it has to just read uh, off the three prime piece uh, of the DNA to uh, end up constructing the appropriate uh, uh, message on the mRNA. So uh, here is a T, it now on, MR, uh, on the uh, MRA, uh, it, it, is, it shows up uh, as an A. The uh, A uh, would translate into thymine, but of course because it's mRNA, it has to be uracil. So it's U. Here is C, so on mRNA it has to be G. So what you'll notice by copying off the three prime strand, it's actually replicated what was on the five prime strand, uh, except that the T's are replaced by U's. Okay, and then now on the tRNA, to match with this, you need to have the sequence uh, uh, of codons that are just the anticodons to this. So on the tRNA, to match with the AUG, you have a UAC. And this is the chain that allows you to uh, uh, properly read uh, uh, match up on the mRNA uh, uh, the, what was originally on the DNA. And here then are the amino acids that are signified by each one of these codons. And that something like this is universally used by every living creature. Uh, out there is uh, pretty amazing. Questions? 
Now. <laughs> I'm always good for a question. Uh, earlier you said that uh, Earlier, you said that the E. coli has the DNA all in one string, but then in some other creatures, maybe us, it's yeah. all broken up into chunks. Is that true for all multicellular creatures? All multicellular creatures uh, have uh, uh, their chromosomes are linear, so they're broken into pe linear pieces. Yes. Is this the same for both wait, plants and wait, wait until you have the microphone or else no one will hear you? Is this the same for both plants and animals? Yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I, Jerry, yeah. Just a small thing. Sure. Uh, a single cell organisms that are not bacteria that have nuclei like cilia that you've seen, like paramecium or amoebas and so on, they have similar chromosomes to what we have. They're not single-stranded the way a bacterial chromosome is. There's a difference. Uh, we have the chromosomes on what are called protozoa, single-celled animals are exactly, in principle, the same as ours as any multicellular organism would have. The bacteria, which are a di different kingdom of organisms, has a single strand, usually a, uh, a circular strand of DNA, contrary to this linear arrangement we have in our chromosomes. Okay, so as I said, that was pretty complicated. So let's just go through it once more. <laughs> okay. uh, so we start out with the E. coli uh, uh, DNA. Uh, you go in and settle on a particular piece that corresponds to a, a genome that's recognized by a uh, set of uh, things that indicate this is the beginning of a uh, particular uh, kind of genome. Uh, you <coughs> this <coughs> when that uh, particular protein is called upon, is called for, uh, this stop is removed and, and the uh, RNA uh, <coughs> synthesis begins. The RNA proceeds to read off the DNA, that piece uh, of uh, RNA, uh, that piece of RNA ends up uh, moving along and getting transcribed into a ribosome uh, using transfer pieces uh, of uh, R -R RNA. Uh, here again uh, is the small pieces, uh, the small unit, large unit, and there's uh, a good deal uh, of, uh, it's not just simple proteins uh, in a ribosome, there's a good deal of RNA, which of course would be required because it has to carry out the function of being able to read what's on the uh, uh, mm -hmm. messenger RNA and, and do the matching up uh, uh, from the pieces of tRNA. And this polypeptide chain, once formed, uh, ends up cooling itself into the appropriate form and shape uh, where it is uh, most useful uh, to the cell. And uh, I've just done it again uh, uh, with w the words uh, as the last uh, transparency. So uh, uh, I think that's <laughs> uh, now time for questions. <laughs> uh, to me, this was uh, the thing that just absolutely got me uh, in, interested in biology with uh, with Lester when I read the paper uh, paper by George Church who was going to play some tricks 
in, in this game uh, to uh, uh, make sure virus couldn't attack the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the E. coli. Uh, it turns out that the viruses were clever than George thought they were. They uh, uh, carried along exactly what they needed to overcome his scheme. Uh, but he, being a human, uh, figured out uh, how to get them. And as you might imagine, the way you do it is you cheat. <laughs> but we'll, we'll get to that uh, in, in, in the last, uh, in, in the uh, seventh uh, seminar. Uh, I think is in many ways the most, uh, will be the most uh, entertaining. Uh, because it will uh, show you uh, just how all this stuff that we've learned uh, that, uh, you know, just, well, it was just wonderful to learn it. What do you do with it? Uh, and, uh, uh, and in the seventh talk, I'll be talking to you about some of the uh, research that's going on that will maybe make us live longer and better lives, healthier lives and uh, maybe allow uh, uh, two males to have offspring. <laughs> That's kind of sexist. How about two females? <laughs> Guess they're already fixed. Uh, I, I, I would imagine uh, it's possible. I, uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't know if a sperm has been created from uh, uh, driving stem cells back uh, to their form. That we're certainly able to drive them back to egg cells. Well, it, it was even in the news this week that they're looking at the uh, creation of new babies out of single cells. Uh, apparently it's been done with mice. Yep. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You said from sick, what was the word? From, from a single cell. Yeah, but we were all created exactly. from single cells. Exactly. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, 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 so why bother? <laughs> we, we have a way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's been working. It just won't be as much fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I'm wondering, uh, as they have been doing these new vaccines uh, through uh, RNA, um, where in this chain it, are these new vaccines for COVID uh, being uh, attacked? Uh, let's see. Uh, well, uh, they were immediately able to identify uh, what the uh, makeup of the virus was. And I think from that could figure out what it attached to uh, in, 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 the, in, in the human. So that very quickly allowed us to develop those uh, drugs. Uh, uh, as I said, uh, you know, that I, I, I worked on cells. Uh, and I didn't allow myself to be distracted by uh, <laughs> what, what they might be used for. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so it's uh, sometimes, I think, a problem that biologists have. I mean, there are so many interesting ways to go with, uh, with what they've got that they often just neglect the subject itself. <laughs> Charles, please make a remark. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, Jerry, thank you so much for sharing the joy of this <laughs> yeah. incredible yeah. puzzle. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just will make one comment. That it, the race to, to crack the code, the race to crack the genetic code, was more than the race between people. For for m many years, the geneticists thought they could solve it. Uh -huh. And in fact, they did solve the first word, the stop code on Sidney Brenner and Francis Crick did that. But then, uh, much to my astonishment, the biochemists um, got the prize. The biochemists jumped in 
and did this uh, very elegantly and with brute force as well. Brilliant. So it was the, the field, two fields were in hot competition, and, and fortunately they, they both got things right. Uh huh. It's a very exciting time. Yeah. From from week to week, day to day, sometimes. That, that, that's much better than the history of cold fusion. <laughs> <laughs> Since there's time for some edification, uh, in terms of this, um, having a parent, I mean, having offspring from one parent, uh, that's pretty easy, actually. Uh, <clears throat> there are many organisms where you can, do which normally in nature, reproduce by having a male and a female, male sperm fertilizing an egg. Uh, there are creatures where the egg can be activated to develop into uh, an adult organism without the benefit, if you will, I consider it a benefit, uh, <laughs> to having a male around. Uh, are there they, any genetic... They can activate uh, uh, eggs of females without the benefit of the sperm, yeah. and so you have a single parent. Yeah. Do you find sperm. any genetic defects in those cases? Uh, I, I don't think, I don't know how carefully they studied the development of these things, but they probably did find de defects. Yeah. yeah. These, mm -hmm. one, the experiments that I know were, were done with amphibia, uh -huh. far to some other related to amphibia. Um, and I presume it could probably be done now with some mammals, but well, it's, and maybe it is being done. But I, I'm going to work. Well, it's done with the mice, possibly, or at least it's attempted. I'm sure of that. Well, um, no, I, if I remember correctly, they uh, were able to uh, uh, take the tail of a male mice uh, mouse and uh, actually from the tail of that mouse, uh, create an egg. It could be activated? Could yes, be. and the could eggs were activated. <laughs> they're, they're not great eggs. Uh, the, uh, if I remember the research that was just reported last month, uh, only something like six or seven out of uh, several hundred uh, ended up uh, getting for, uh, becoming fertilized and uh, making uh, and creating an offspring. Oh, that's not bad. But, but then it required <laughs> a sperm to 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 activate. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm talking about activating an egg without sperm. Yes, but you'd have just one set of chromosomes then. Well, the chances are, if the if the organism survived, it probably doubled its chromosome number uh -huh. in the process of. The so body. it was clone. It's probably then a clone. I'm, so, I'm sorry. It's probably then a clone, unless so some accident took place. It would, it would be clonal, but it, it, the chances are it's not going to survive because there are recessive genes that are when they are in an egg, they yeah. one parent or the other has the and the recessive uh, okay. devastating gene would be mass by the uh, gene on the inherited from the other parents. So you bet. Be, but if it's <clears throat> just doubling the normal, I mean the single set of chromosomes, a recessive would be doubled and it would still be there and not uh, masked and uh, it probably, the organism probably wouldn't develop to adults. So, yeah. Uh, I don't think we want to go into all those details. <laughs> <laughs> if they can uh, take a cells from a tail, as we know, and make an egg out of them, it doesn't matter whether the tail comes from a male or a female mouse, I assume. Uh, they, well, did, uh, uh, they did it from a male, but it, they could have done it from a female mouse too. And right? they did do it first from a female oh, mouse. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, presumably they could also make a stem cell that will produce sperm. Why not? If you can make an egg, why can't you do it to make a sperm uh, cell? I, I, I don't know the answer to that. And if they could, then they could have a... Oh, no, well, you bet. You bet. How, now, how about you take it instead of from an animal, a viviparous animal like a mouse, you could have take some oviparous animal and make an egg and make a sperm, fertilize the egg, then you don't need to implant it and you've actually created life. Whereas they say now they haven't created life because they have to implant that other egg in a living animal. But if you did it with an oviparous animal, you actually recreate life. Mm -hmm. Well, I certainly... Uh, Be interesting. Uh, yeah. uh, I don't know of any case like that, but I have heard of the trying to make artificial placenta. Uh -huh. And with an artificial placenta... Uh, well, with the oviparous animal, you don't need a placenta. Pardon me? With the oviparous animal, you don't need a placenta. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, I... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think Paul had a question. Paul uh, had a question. With the original base pairs, they only line up with, with one other of the base pairs. That's correct. But why couldn't they uh, join up with any other floating chemicals uh, in the in the cell? Well, uh, I mean, obviously they could. I mean, there's just the laws of chemistry, and somehow this magnificent process called life, some, followed by evolution, uh, 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 allows it to not happen uh, as often as you might think uh, in, a, in a thing called a cell. Okay. Yeah. I was speculating that maybe it's the structure of the surrounding material that only allows that uh, other base pair to fit in. I, I, but I'm not, I have no idea what the really answer is. So. Yeah, well, uh, it, it's pretty clear that, you know, there is a very specific environment yeah. uh, within the cell and... Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, here we go. Jerry, could I just add one more in, in, in component that, so the answer is partly the, the right. microphone? <laughs> That's partly correct what you said, that surrounding material helps with the stability, but thermodynamically um, it takes more than just three nucleotides, pairing with three other nucleotides for serious stability. So the short size of the codons and anticodons prevents many of these nonspecific interactions from occurring. Normally 12 or 14 or 20 bases are required for stability. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all. Wow. Thank you.